Hello, once again, we are in Fundamentals of Cost Accounting, Chapter 2, Cost Concepts and Behavior. In this chapter, hopefully, you get through it and you don't give up. Um, you should be able to um, explain the basic concept of cost, explain how costs are presented in financial statements, explain the process of cost allocation, um, understand how material, labor, and overhead costs are added to a product at each stage of the production process, define cost behaviors, including fixed, variable, semi-variable, and step costs, identify the, the, con the components of a product cost, and understand the distinction between financial and contribution margin for income statements. Cost is a sacrifice of resources, and that's a nice term, but it's really something that you have to give up. I would say cost is something you give up. Um, so what is cost versus expenses? Expenses is going to be a matching of your costs or your, what you pay against the revenue it generates in a specific accounting period. But in our, our discussion, we're going to be talking about costs in terms of outlay of money, maybe um, present and future outflow of money. Um, it also includes the foregone costs or benefits that you would have received if you did something else. So we want to think about costs in that terms, um, in, in those terms to better understand managerial accounting. So costs in financial statements generally, this is what you're going to see. You're going to see your revenues, you're going to see your cost of goods sold, you're going to see your gross margin, and you're going to see your administrative costs and your operating profit. This is nothing new. It's just sometimes we use a different word when we're talking about gross margin. You would probably say gross profit, maybe, if you're talking about information from a financial accounting perspective, but it really does mean the same. And here are the expenses. Here is another presentation of costs. Uh, cost expenses being assigned to products sold during a period of time and the operating revenues the operating profit, which is the excess of your revenues and your and your costs. Here is the cost of goods statement, and it really does give you a good idea of how to calculate cost of goods sold, which starts with your beginning inventory. You're going to be your cost of goods purchased, whether it be your merchandise costs and transportation costs and other costs, which gives you your goods available for sale. Then you subtract from that your ending inventory, which gives you your cost of goods sold. And this is not anything new. You've done, you've seen this before in financial accounting. Presentation of costs in financial statements. Again, take a look at this particular diagram here. It's really just giving you an idea of what um, the, the little, I would say, differences in the presentation and the nomenclature in the financial statements when you're preparing them really on a, on a, I would say from a perspective of a managerial accounting. Look at this particular statement and see how very similar it is to a normal or a regular financial statement. It has its revenues, it has its cost of goods sold, but if you notice here where it says gross margin, generally in financial accounting you're going to see gross profit then you see your less your um, administrative costs. Then you see your operating profit before taxes. Here you might see net income or gross income before taxes. But in the end, you kind of know exactly what you're looking at. And with some of the terms being a little different, it still has it still has an accounting flavor to it. You don't lose your accounting, even though we're deviating a little bit from. Um, we're deviating a little bit from um, GAAP. Product cost versus period cost. Cost related to inventory is going to be product cost. Period cost are non-manufacturing cost related to the firm. Again, an example of a period cost could be depreciation. Just giving you some ideas of how to think of things a little bit different. And because um, we're going to recognize costs as incurred for period costs, they're really not going to be something that we're going to consider when we're talking about cost accounting. We're going to be using costs that are recorded as assets in inventory when incurred, and we're going to move those um, those items to cost of goods sold when is when the item is actually sold. So it's a little different way of thinking about things. Um, just remember that there are a number of terms. Some of them are very very similar, as I mentioned in the previous slide. Some are very different, 
And right now with chapter two, you're just getting a flavor of, of comparing the differences and particularly as it relates to the, the different terminology. Direct and indirect costs, and again, in a manufacturing department, a direct cost or um, direct materials is going to be something that is going to be traceable, directly traceable to a product. And the same is true for labor. Indirect costs, as you know, it can be traced directly to a product. And overhead, again, it's going to be um, production costs, except for direct materials and direct labor, it's going to be indirect materials and indirect labor. Now, it could be supervisors who are on the job, not necessarily in a manufacturing process, but they oversee, they schedule individuals to work. Um, materials could very well be just that you can't necessarily trace those particular costs to a product being uh, manufactured simply because it affects everything in the process, not necessarily a specific product. Prime costs are going to be primary cost of the product. Conversion costs are going to be cost necessary to convert those materials into a product itself. Remember, this chapter is loaded with different terms, none of which are difficult, but they're different, and you need to be able to understand what they mean and how to apply them, because the book's going to take these terms and assume you know them, and they're going to be speaking along those lines, and you're going to have to know what these terms mean, because they're going to be constantly being thrown at you in different chapters and different scenarios, so it's important to know what these terms mean. And I think if you get anything out of the chapter, that would be it, knowing the terms that are different understand what they mean and then we'll be working over the next few weeks applying those terms into different situations and different um, scenarios. So non-manufacturing costs as you know could be marketing, could be administrative, it could be accounting like myself. I mean if I'm just preparing overall or it could be some kind of cost in accounting that relates to payables or bills not necessarily traceable to any, any particular um, job or manufacturing process but are absolutely necessary nevertheless. Allocating costs. We're going to take a cost and we're going to spread it out to the production process. So it's a process of assigning indirect costs to product services and business units. Again, we need to allocate those costs. We know these costs have accumulated, but we're going to take a measuring stick and just allocate it to various products to get the true cost of manufacturing that product. So you're going to define the cost pool. You're going to determine the cost allocation rule, and we're going to talk about that a lot. And you're going to assign the cost pool to the object, the product, product line, department, or customer. And here is an example. Again, we are not going to get into any major examples in this overview. My, my whole goal is to give you an idea of what we're going to be talking about and the concepts that are really, really important for you to understand in order for you to, um, to do well on your homework as well as doing home well on your, um, your quizzes and other um, graded assignments. So the cost pool is going to be the, um, the information systems department cost, and it's a million dollars. So determine the cost allocation rule. Costs are going to be allocated based on divisional revenue. That's going to be the rule. So we have revenue total of $100 million, but two different divisions. $80 million for one division, $20 million for another division. So if you look at that, you can immediately see it's an 80-20 split. So here we are. The, um, the, the cost is a million dollars, and we're going to take that cost and apply it to two different departments based on the allocation rule. Very, very straightforward. Next, we're going to understand how material, labor, and overhead costs are added to a product at each stage of the production process. They are recorded in inventory. Remember, when you buy these products or these, these materials or these different types of items that you need, you're going to be buying it and you're going to record it as an asset. Inventory is an asset, and you know this. So it's going to sit in inventory and it's going to move along the process from inventory with raw materials, for example, and it's going to move from raw materials to goods and process, and it's going to move from goods and process to finished goods, and then once it's sold, it moves out of finished goods to cost of goods sold. And that will be your general process. And here is the definitions of the, the terms that I've just used. Again, these terms are not new because I believe in, in principles too. You've actually all gone over these. So let's take a look at the detail of what makes up a balance sheet would have these types of items in it. Again, direct materials inventory. You start with your beginning raw materials. You add your purchases. Then you have your raw materials available for production. Again, very, very similar 
to um, another um, items that we've seen in the past. Then you subtract your um, raw materials inventory to come up with your raw materials transfer to work in process. And again, it's adding a step if you can see it here. Then you start, you move that raw materials and then you start with the, um, the whip inventory, your beginning whip inventory. You add your direct materials transfer from raw materials as you can see the arrow. Add your direct labor, your manufacturing overhead, which gives you your total manufacturing cost. You're going to subtract your ending. You're, you're going to have your whip ending inventory. Then all the goods that have been completed and transferred over to your finished goods. That means they're already done. Once the work is done on that product, it gets transferred out of work and process inventory to finished goods. Then you get finished goods inventory, your cost of goods completed, which we have here in the arrow. Gives you your goods available for sale, which in, in turn is your ending finished goods inventory. Once those goods are sold, they are, they are removed out of finished goods and transferred to your cost of goods sold, which is on your income statement. And again, here is an, another illustration how costs flow through the financial statements. Now, cost of good manufacturing and sold statement. This is not a, a statement that you would provide to an external user. This is all for internal use. Now, take a look at what you see here. This is the cost of goods manufactured and sold statement. And you start with your beginning inventory. Here is a delineation of your direct materials. Then you have your direct labor. That gives you, and then you add to that your manufacturing overhead to give you your total manufacturing costs incurred. And here we are. Taking that number of 13,000, adding to our beginning, we come to a total work in process during the year. Subtracting from that your ending inventory, which gives you your cost of goods manufactured. This is very, very similar to um, the cost of goods sold when you would use in a retail establishment or a, a, a wholesaler. But again, the similarities are enough for you to be able to see that there is a relationship and there's not a very big leap into figuring out the differences between the two you can see clearly that there are some differences. Make note of these differences as you're going through this chapter because this chapter really it provides a foundation for being able to analyze transactions and the flow of goods and the cost of goods and how it behaves from a managerial perspective and it really does serve as a great foundation for our, um, throughout the, um, the course. Cost behavior. Define cost behaviors, including fixed, variable, similar variable, and step costs. This is nothing new. Again, this is a reiteration of principles two when we were talking about managerial accounting. We just touched on it in that course. How do costs respond to change in activity level? That's the behavior. Activity levels within a t t given total fixed cost or variable cost will be unchanged. That is going to be the relevant range. Again, this chapter is filled with so many terms. Do not become overwhelmed by these terms because many of them you have seen before. Fixed costs remain unchanged despite changes in volume. Fixed costs per unit may vary inversely to the change of activity and fixed costs are fixed in total as activity changes. Remember that it's important to see the relationships and although you may not necessarily see so much of this, um, these principles in this chapter, you will undoubtedly see it in the future chapters and it's all going to make sense. My goal for you in this chapter is really get familiar with the terms and understand what these terms really mean for managerial accounting as this is a very very foundational um, chapter and it is in many ways a review of what you've learned in, in principles too. Well costs that change in proportion to the volume is going to be a variable cost and it varies. That means the more you produce the more it's going to cost. Now how it varies may not be uh, dollar for dollar but it may very well be in a step um, format, meaning it, it progressively gets higher but in different increments. But the bottom line is as production does go up, the variable costs go up as well. And that's important to note. The relevant range. And again, we talked about the term here. This is just giving you a visual picture of what the relevant range is. And then you're going to be assigning costs based on that. Some of variable costs are going to have a, a combination of fixed and variable. 
And I would think an example of that would be a salary person, or no, an hourly person working 40 hours, but then adding overtime to that. That would be, a fix would be a salary piece, and then a bonus or overtime hours would be the variable, would mean it would change. So when you have those kind of costs that change, partly change and partly is fixed, you have a, a variable cost. And you also can say it's NICS cost. Step costs increase in total with steps and the volume changes to a particular level. Again, some of fixed costs. They don't go straight up, but they do go up in kind of in a, a incremental fashion, if we would um if I could use that word in this in this context. Components of product costs. Full costs, full absorption costs, and variable costs. And again, I don't want to go through all of the definitions and terms. I do want to highlight them because they're important for you to remember. This chapter, gosh, I, I don't know. I think I've been through maybe 10 different terms that you will need to know. Do not become overwhelmed with these terms. I will, can assure you, you will probably see these terms over and over and over again. This chapter is going to be introducing you to these terms and how to use them. Components of product costs, and we already know it's going to be the direct materials and labor. The variable costs will be variable overhead and fixed overhead. And it's going to also be administrative costs, whether it be variable or fixed. Full absorption costing required by GAP. Now, again, we're going to, what we're doing in this particular slide is just showing you the differences between what, it, what you would see for GAP accounting versus what you would see for managerial cost accounting. Variable costing is something that you're going to see quite a bit, but it's used for managerial and internal use. Really, it's about contribution margin. Your revenue minus your variable cost gives you your contribution margin and seeing the similarities between the two. Just want you to get an idea that we are using information for internal users. So, full absorption costing is really for income statement purposes. And then we're talking now for cost accounting, contribution margin is really going to be something that's going to be useful and um, for internal users. This is just giving you um, what it would look like if you're using a GAP financial statement. variable costing. Again, this particular slide is going to be useful. I, I would say put it into your memory because when you're looking at your statements, internal statements, this is what you're going to see and this is what you'll probably be preparing on, get, depending on the, the actual assignment given. You care about the sales revenue, you care about your variable cost because you are going to be computing your gross your contribution margin. Knowing the relationship among these variables or these different items is going to be important too because there are some times when you're going to have to back into it. So knowing the relationship among these variables are going to be important. Then you, from your contribution margin you're going to take your fixed cost to come up with your operating profit. This chapter is extremely important. I highly recommend you read through the chapter once and then go through each one of the new terms that are not familiar to you. There are terms that are familiar to you, that, to you, which ones that you have used in your principles to class. I would like for you when you go through the chapter again to go through it in light of the terms that you are not familiar with to get from, to learn those terms and what relationship it has to managerial accounting. I very much appreciate you listening and I will talk to you in the next chapter.